Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Studies in Jewish Education at Brandeis University. I'm John Levison, director of the center, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this ongoing series of conversations with scholars of Jewish education. We created the series as a way to share scholarship in the field of Jewish education with a broad audience of educators and Jewish leaders. At the Mandel Center, we are committed to developing and promoting scholarship in Jewish education in order to make a deep and lasting difference on the lives of learners and the vibrancy of the Jewish community. That's our mission. Today's session and our other events help us to serve our mission by getting important ideas out into the world. We encourage you to take a look at the Mandel Center events page to see the rest of our upcoming events. We're delighted to have so many of you joining us live, uh, and we hope to be able to take some of your questions as we go. So feel free to post those questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. And we're also recording today's session, and we'll make the recording available afterwards on our website and our podcast for those who couldn't join us today. Our guest today is my friend and colleague, Ilana Horowitz. Ilana is a sociologist of religion, a sociologist of education. She holds a PhD from Stanford, and she is currently assistant professor of Jewish studies and sociology and the Fields Rayant Chair of Contemporary Jewish Life at Tulane University in New Orleans. And today we're going to talk with her about an article that she recently published with some colleagues on the subject of how Jewish girls are brought up in America to do well in school and in their careers. The title of the article is From Bat Mitzvah to the Bar, Religious Habitus, Self-Concept and Women's Educational Outcomes. And it was published in the American Sociological Review. Alana, welcome. It is good to see you. Thanks for having me, John. Our pleasure, our pleasure. As I just mentioned, we wanna talk about your recent article um, and, uh, and hear more about the findings um, about Jewish girls and women. But first, I want to understand more of the backstory. How did you decide that you wanted to study Jewish girls and educational attainment? And then also tell us a little bit about the methodology, how you undertook the study itself. Yeah, I actually didn't set out to do this study. I set out to um, figure out a unique data set, data set that I had access to. So when I was in graduate school at Stanford, and thinking about my dissertation, the National Study of Youth and Religion data set fell into sort of my lap. And the NSYR data set is very unique in different dimensions. But one of the things that makes it unique is that it has a, an oversample of American Jewish adolescents who were followed over a 10 year period from 2002 to 2013. And the reason that's important is because it's very hard to compare Jews and national studies because they make up such a small percentage of the population that there's not enough power to basically do any real analysis with them. And this data set, the NSYR, had both a survey component and an interview component. And so usually I don't advise people to start with the data and then figure out the research question or the puzzle or the paradox, but that is what happened in this case. So I got access to these data and I just started reading interviews with the Jewish adolescents in the study. And for several months, I sat and I poured over these interviews. And you know what, John? They were really boring. They didn't sound interesting to me at all. They sounded like all the people that I knew and there was no story. And so I kind of put it aside. And then I started thinking more broadly about the role of religion in people's lives. And I came back to the data set and I started reading interviews with the non-Jewish participants of the same socioeconomic background, right? This was really important. We know that socioeconomic status predicts all sorts of things in life shapes how we perceive the world. So I started thinking about the high socioeconomic status kids in the sample. And that's when so things got, got interesting. So now you're comparing Jewish kids. Uh, well, at this point, I'm not really comparing anything yet. So okay. get, I'll get to that. So I started just reading interviews with 
high socioeconomic status kids in America broadly, not even necessarily comparing them to the Jewish kids who sounded really boring to me. And I, I remember reading a few of them and I was like, these people don't sound like anything like what I grew up with. They don't sound like me. They don't sound like my friends. Um, and they don't sound like the Jewish kids in the sample. And the differences were especially prominent in the, in the narratives of girls um, and who I followed over the 10 year period. So I got to see how their lives unfolded. And then I ended up, um, I wanted to check myself. So I went to a couple of other graduate students and I had them read the interview transcripts. And I was like, did these Jewish girls sound really different than these non-Jewish girls or is it my imagination? And they're like, oh, and they were not Jewish, right? This is important because I wanted to check my own sort of like reflexivity and subjectivity in the matter. And they're like, these two groups of people sound totally different. The Jewish girls do not sound like what I grew up with. And so then we were like, oh, there's something there, there. Um, and so what ended up, what sort of becoming this project was the realization that there was something in the narratives of girls raised by Jewish parents versus girls raised by non-Jewish parents that told us something about the ways in which young girls, as young as 13, 14, imagine their lives unfolding, the way they imagine what I call in the paper a self-concept, the way in which their view of themselves and their future comes to be the role of parenthood in that story, the role of education in that story, the sort of prominence that they want to have in the world, what it means to have self-fulfillment. Um, and this led to this um, us to hypothesize that for Jewish girls, it seemed like education was a really central thing, um, and especially elite higher education, as a way to achieve the kinds of career goals that they had for themselves. Um, and so we ended up um, eventually realizing that what we could do is make an argument to a broader sociological audience who thinks about stratification and higher education, meaning like why people have different outcomes in college outcomes people generally think of it as a story about class, gender, and race. And we realized that actually a religious subculture also is part of the story, that social class is not explaining the entire, what we call the habitus that children are growing up in, the air that they breathe, that the religious subculture that they grow up in also matters. And so the way in which, which these things function together basically puts girls raised by Jewish parents on a different path through higher education. And we do that using survey data, using um, uh, interview data, but the intervention is really into a broader debate about sociology and stratification and higher education, not just into a Jewish studies conversation. Right. So, so here I want to just emphasize that it was particularly important that you did look that you you were comparing. Um, you know, you said earlier that initially you were you were not looking at the comparison, but over time, then you started to say, "How do these young women?" Um, you also looked at at men, but then eventually you you zeroed in on on the women. Maybe we'll talk about that as well. Um, how do they? sound different than comparable women in terms of um, class background. And that's particularly important because you, as you said, um, we know from lots of other important research that class has enormous implications for educational attainment. The other thing I want to emphasize just to, to tease out is that you, you had access both to quantitative data and qualitative data. So these you you saw these interviews with these um, with these kids these these young women over time, um, and so you were really able to get a sense of what how they talked about themselves. Um, but you also had the quantitative data. So tell you a little bit more about why that was important. Yeah, and the quantitative data. So it's both a, a nationally representative survey of adolescents in America, which allows us to um, make broad sort of macro level claims that are generalizable about higher education outcomes. We also did this unique thing where we linked the NSYR to the National Student Clearinghouse, which basically houses on a um, the higher education data of everybody in this country on a semester by semester basis. And this is important because in longitudinal data, you have an attrition problem where people tend to fall out after the first wave, they tend to be lower income. Um, and so to overcome this this issue, this attrition issue, linking it, linking our data to the National Student Clearinghouse gave us a much more robust and, and sort of, um, we had more confidence in the data that we were telling about higher education. It also importantly, not um, didn't just tell us 
how many, how much um, college education somebody had, but also where they went to school. And so our study looks um, it, both at attainment, but also selectivity. And it turns out that girls raised by Jewish parents are not just more likely to graduate from college than non than girls raised by non-Jewish parents from high SES families, but they are also more likely to go to more selective colleges. So there's both a process of vertical stratification and horizontal stratification. Um, and there was a, and there was also another dimension of the data, John, that is important to note that made the study unique. Prior studies that had found that Jews have higher rates of educational attainment always look at adults and retrospectively ask them, like, what's your religious affiliation? This is a problem because it makes it sound like being Jewish, right, just essentially positions you for better educational outcomes. But when we attribute educational success or educational failure simply to one's religious subculture or to one's race or one's ethnicity, we go down a road of basically saying like, oh, kids who are black in America have you know worse educational outcomes. And it's not because they are black, right? Being black doesn't cause you to do poorly in school. There are a whole host of structural, cultural, social, psychological factors that are associated with being black. And we have to understand those mechanisms so that we don't attribute educational success or failure to actually like people's racial, ethnic, or religious background. So in right. this um, project, we were able to move away from just looking at how kids identify, but look at how their parents identify because there's a parent component and really try to understand the family socialization process that we think plays a big role in the mechanism explaining the educational advantage. Right, right. So the way I think about it is you were not satisfied simply by saying, well, look, here, we found this thing about Jews or, or Jewish girls and women, um, and that's, and then assuming in a way that that being Jewish is a cause, you actually are able to kind of unpack that. Well, what is it about the way that these kids were raised that sort of plausibly connects? And that's especially where the, the, um, where the qualitative data is so important. But before we get too, too much further, you've already mentioned a few of things. I just wanna, I want you to be as explicit as possible. So what did you find? What are the kind of top line finds? You talked about that, that, um, that Jewish girls go to um, uh, graduate from college at, at high rates, that they go to more selective schools at high rates. Say, say more about that. Yeah, so quantitatively, the key finding is that girls raised by Jewish parents, and this is why I actually make this language explicit, I don't talk about it as Jewish girls. I talk about it as girls raised by Jewish parents because I'm trying to move away from this essentializing of Jewishness. Um, but that girls raised by Jewish parents go on to complete um, college at higher rates and go on to uh, more selective colleges. And the reason for that, and importantly, having two Jewish parents is, uh, in terms of their outcomes, better than having just one Jewish parent, and that's better than having no Jewish parents. And so there is, uh, we were able to sort of measure the extent of their Jewish socialization by looking at the number of um, Jewish parents that they're growing up with. Um, but qualitatively, and this is where the theoretical um, sort of contribution comes in, we show that girls raised by at least one Jewish parent, and especially those with two Jewish parents, they articulate these self-concepts marked by elite career goals and an eagerness to have new experiences. And as a result, this quest for self-concept congruence, this desire to want to sort of create a life that matches what people in your community expect of you, it entails these elaborate plans for elite higher education and graduate school. Girls raised by Jewish parents frame college as this broadening experience and this human capital investment, which sets the stage for high impact careers. Career first, motherhood second. And by contrast, John, girls raised by non-Jewish parents rarely frame college as a necessary precursor to, precursor to a prestigious career. Their quest for self-concept congruence um, revolves more around motherhood and around altruism. And going to college is a norm for them, but college selectivity is not of paramount importance. Um, and I'm happy to share like, a couple of like quotes that illustrate this. Would that be helpful? Yeah. I, yeah, absolutely. I, I do want to, um, cause I'm, I'm, I, I think it's very helpful to kind of hear what the, what 
what this sounds like um, among um, among these young people. Um, and I just want to put a pin on it. I'd like to circle back. You use the term better, and I know better outcomes, and I and I know what you meant by that, which is better according to the things that you were measuring. But I want to circle back to how you think about this category because you actually wrote Absolutely. about it, right? What does it mean to have better outcomes? But first, tell us tell us what the girls sound like. Okay, so. This is Debbie. Debbie's a 17 year old when she says this. She's a, a daughter of two Jewish parents. Um, she says, I'd like to make a mark. I'm not the type of person who's okay not being in the limelight. I crave attention in that I really want to make a mark that's noticeable, like being known in whatever industry I'm in. I want to be a prominent figure. I heard this from Stacy, who was 13, also actually adopted from Korea by two Jewish parents. She hopes to become a lawyer, saying, um, I want to be somebody that people remember in history. I want to be somebody important. Um, and Stacy, this is just one one other one from the Jewish case. Um, she is the, she's a sort of an epitome of this career first, motherhood second mentality. She says, I, she's 19 when she says this. I'm career oriented. I have a lot more friends who are in relationships. It's very serious. They want to get married, start a family, that kind of thing. I think I'm going to do that eventually, but I'm 19 now. So I'm not really focused on that. It might be something I get to later. So, the, so and that's that about, might be like, oh yeah, that's like what people sound like. So let me contrast that. Okay. With so this is Mandy. She's seventeen. She doesn't have any Jewish parents. Um, she says, I think the biggest thing that a mother can do is be with her kids. That is the greatest thing over her career. That's not saying she can't use her intellect. I have some intelligence. I've done pretty well. I had scholarships and things like that, but. I don't mind just being a mother. I don't view it as just being a mother. You can still use all that stuff in an even greater calling in life. Um, and then I'll just give you one other example of a woman who says, I wanna have a career, but I would never wanna do something halfway. I'd feel like if I had kids and I had a career, it'd be too hard to split them because I really just wanna be a good mom. And then she goes on to talk about the importance of being a good mom. And it's not that these girls don't go to college. They see college as an important part of middle, upper class adulthood. But for them, college is not the central part of them reaching self-concept congruence, partly because a prestigious career is not something that is of high priority to them. Yeah. So so a big what you've been emphasizing here is sort of how how these young people imagine their futures and then actually how they imagine getting to those futures. But there's another piece that I don't want to lose sight of that you mentioned in the paper, you mentioned in passing here, which has to do with openness to new experiences. Wait, so it's not only uh, I want to have a career and eventually I'll get to, and the inevitable tension between career and motherhood and sort of where the emphasis, there's also this piece about openness to new experiences. Can you say something more about that? Yeah. Um you know, because this is a, a session with, with the Mandel Center, I think you would appreciate this quote. There was, I don't know if it made it into the paper, but there was one person, uh, one or two people who actually talked about how in Hebrew school, they learned that Jews are supposed to question things and that part of being Jewish for them is being open to new ideas and part uh, and, and sort of being willing to push on um, existing ideas and not just taking things as they are. And this is sort of emblematic of this broader um, worldliness, cosmopolitanism that I noticed amongst girls who are growing up in Jewish families is this desire to leave their home, the desire to travel, the desire to try something new. There's no hesitation about um, sort of being uncomfortable, either socially, intellectually, where it, there is amongst other religious subcultures, um, and for girls who are growing up non, even not religious, um, a sort of yearning for more social homogeneity, a sort of reticence to leave home, um, a comfort with sort of the known. Mm -hmm. um, and the, you know, if you are somebody who's going to be open to new experiences, right, that makes you more comfortable to go and sort of leave home, go to a college that is maybe farther away from you. Um, and that might be one of the reasons they go to more selective colleges. Yeah. Um, but this question about, well, actually, let me turn it back to you. So I I, I want to um, uh, invite any uh, questions from the audience. You should feel free to use the Q and A, um, and we'll monitor those questions as we go. Um, but but you just used the phrase religious subculture, and I want to I want to drill down a little bit because um, you're not 
from what I understand, you're not actually referring to, or you weren't looking particularly at what we would in other contexts think about as, as a kind of measure of religiosity. So you're not particularly interested in, you know, how often these young people pray or whether they keep kosher or perform other kinds of rituals. So, so tell us a little bit more about what religious subculture means in this context. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So religious subculture has to do not just with one's level of religiosity, right? Um, but also the sort of social and cultural milieu of your religious group. And so we can imagine conservative Protestants. Conservative Protestants, many of them are um, score high on traditional measures of religiosity, but conservative Protestants as a sort of religious subculture also have a particular kind of um, views on politics and on social issues that is sort of in the conservative Protestant ethos, regardless of how often they go to church or not. Jewish subculture, religious subculture, and to, I want to be really clear that this was a paper um, based on data from an almost exclusively non-Orthodox sample. All the girls either, um, you know, they were, two th this was 2002, 2003 when they were first sampled and it did ask for their religious affiliation. Um, and so most of them identified as refer reform, conservative or non-denominational Jewish, but none of them are really Orthodox. So this is a story about non-Orthodox girls. Um, and so what we talk about is there are stories that are, you know, that we hear in sort of Jewish circles. There are messages that we get in Jewish circles. Those come from our own families. They come when we go to synagogue. They come from interacting with people in our social cultural milieu. Um, it happens when we go and interact with people at bar and bat mitzvahs, when we see people um, uh, sort of come over for the holidays. There's the kinds of stories that Jews tell around the table. All of those sort of things that have nothing to do with just, you know, how often do you pray, constitute a, what I call religious subculture. And subculture here matters because it is the kinds of messages that girls get in their home that are not just class-based, but also, um, you know, sort of Jewish-based about what it is that girls can accomplish in the world. Um, Judaism, counter to sort of what many people believe, is probably like the most gender egalitarian religion in America, like more so than Protestantism in many dimensions. And so the egalitarianism of Judaism, of Jewish life, means that when parents are raising their children, they're telling their boys, they're telling their sons and their daughters that they can be anything that they want to be. Those messages are not gendered in the way that they are in other religious subcultures and in broader American society. Like you don't have to be religious in America to receive very gendered messages about what you can do in the world. And because this is a session on learning, right? Like this is really um, a paper about what it is that young Jewish girls uh, or girls um, in Jewish homes are learning about the things that are possible for themselves. And those learnings are really subtle. We probably don't even realize that we're teaching our kids these things. Um, but the messages that sort of Jewish institutions, Jewish families are teaching their girls, teach them um, that there's a very egalitarian world for them and that they can, right. can do these things. Yeah. And so it's this is about learning how to be a person in the world, learning how to be a Jew in the world, right? That, that they, these are the messages um, that that kids get. Um, there's actually uh, there was a really interesting question from one of our um, one of our guests about um, uh, kind of the pa following paths of other people to more selective institutions. So when we think about you know how do I get a message about what's normal for me for people like me, um, there may be things that people tell me, but I, I also see my peers that are mm -hmm. one or two or three steps advanced. Um, and and I that also sets sets a set of nor I imagine that that sets sets up norms for me like oh these are the places that people like me go to school these are the kinds of careers that people like me have and that starts to become part of my own self concept do we do we see that particularly in terms of the where Jews go to school that tend to yeah. go to school. Absolutely. We see it in terms of where Jews go to school, but also the kinds of careers that they imagine for themselves. Many of these girls had parents, you know, moms who are lawyers, who are doctors, um, not just moms, but other people in their extended family and in their community. And you are absolutely right. Kids in America cannot imagine careers for themselves when they don't have that modeled for them. The amount of role modeling. And so the fact that American 
um, Jews, especially Jewish women in the second half of the 20th century, came into very professional kinds of careers that set the stage for what we're seeing now in the 21st century with, um, with young girls following in their footsteps. There is a sort of interesting thing that this is separate, but um, I think listeners uh, might be interested to know the gender, there's a big sort of gender divide that's happening both in American education, and we see it in Jewish families as well, where in the 80s, girls started to sort of uh, surpass boys. And now not only are girls surpassing boys, including Jewish girls, but the boys' educational attainment is falling, and we're seeing that amongst the, the Jewish boys as well. And I don't really know why that's happening. Um, but it's also possible that the kinds of messages that we're now sharing about professions and, and careers and college are changing. So this is a story just to keep in mind about, you know, girls going up in the early part of the 21st century. Right, right. So girls great, raised in, in Jewish homes. And and what you found in the, you know, in, in looking at the data is that there was this significant discrepancy between girls raised in Jewish homes and girls who were not raised in Jewish homes. And you didn't see as much of a discrepancy among the men, as I recall. Yeah. Um, initially, this was a paper both about girls and boys. And as I read it over and over again, I realized that this really interesting stories had to do um, we're all coming from the women. That's where really the differences were. And that's when this paper sort of took on a, a new lens talking about the role of gender. What does Judaism and gender, what does that intersection look like? Why might that be unique for girls? Um, the narratives of boys just weren't that different. Yeah. Um, I, I want to ask, we only have a couple minutes left, but I, I want to ask about the kind of the broader argument here about why religion matters. Um, you've made this in other other um, works of scholarship as well. Um, that um, uh, that well, one place you wrote that religious upbringing has fallen off the list of primary variables that educational stratification researchers use. It's it has fallen off the list, and you're arguing it needs to be back on the list. Can you explain that? I do. Yeah. So we can, in tracing the scholarship on sociology of religion and sociology at large, we can see that in the 50s and 60s, actually, a lot of people were thinking about religion because in America, like everybody was going to church in the sort of post-war period, right? This was a really central feature of life. And sociologists were talking about religion as a potential source of stratification. But then there were some studies that um, came out that said, oh, actually religion is just a proxy for social class. That if you're just looking, if you just control for social class, religion sort of goes away. And so for the past couple of decades, religion hasn't really been part of the conversation. When I started this paper and I started my dissertation at Stanford and I said I wanted to focus on uh, the role of religion in educational outcomes, um, some of my Stanford advisors um, and professors sort of uh, told me I was not going to go into a, a you know the right direction and it's just a function of social class and that there was nothing there there but i didn't believe that to be true based on data that i'd seen this is a country where a good quarter of americans still very much organize their lives around religion we see this in the way that we uh you know you open the news right religion shapes politics and social attitudes in all sorts of ways and if we are ignoring the way in which about a quarter of americans live um, we're really missing, as especially people who think about education, like if a quarter of American teenagers in our classrooms really organize their lives around religion and think about, you know, the role of God or the role of their churches, um, if we sort of discount that, we are missing a big way in which kids might be learning things about the world um, and how religion is, religion is informing that. And so my book and this paper shows that it's not just a function of social class. Religion explains variance in education outcomes beyond class, beyond gender, beyond race. It functions on its own. It's interwoven um, with stories of class and gender, for sure, and race as well. Um, but we, if we want to understand people living in America and educational stratification, we need to think about religion. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, so then we only have a minute. I want to ask you my final question that I, I always like to ask, which is, what do you think Jewish educators should learn from this article. Why does this research matter? This research matters because we think often of Jewish education as happening maybe within the school domain or within, you know, Hebrew school domain. A lot of what kids learn about being Jewish in America happens in the home. It happens in the family. It happens when we interact with other people in the Jewish community. 
that subtlety, uh, that learning is really subtle, but we are always sending messages to our children, especially to our um, girls about what is possible for themselves. Um, this gets manifested not just in their um, higher education trajectories, but in their confidence and their, uh, in their, in their confidence and their ability to talk about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in their confidence about um, all sorts of things. And so I want people to always be thinking about like, what are the messages I'm sending to my kid about what it means to be a Jew in America, um, regardless of whether that conversation is happening in schools, in Hebrew school, um, uh, in synagogue, or in the home. Right. Wonderful. You could say that Jews are always learning how to be Jewish. Um, and so the more that we, whoever the we is, that Jewish educators, Jewish leaders can be aware of those learning processes, um, the more our uh, will be able to achieve outcomes, whatever they, whatever they are. Um, thank you, Alana. It's always a pleasure to talk with you about your work. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us. I encourage you to check out the Mandel Center events page to learn about our uh, other upcoming events, videos, podcasts of our prior events. Our next session in this series will be on May 3rd. Uh, we will have a special guest sitting in as our host and interviewer. That will be my colleague, Jonathan Krasner, serving as the host. I will be sitting in the other seat. I will be sitting in the scholar's seat. Um, Jonathan and I will be talking about an article that I recently wrote about um, the influential Jewish educational theorist Seymour Fox and his uh, Visions of Jewish Education Project. Looking forward to that conversation. Thank you again, Alana. Thank you all for joining us. Be well. Thank you.